the May 2021 COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. So we hope you're all doing well today. My name is Helen Yang. I'm a student at Columbia University. I'm an assistant at the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub and a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. So the COVID Information Commons or KIC is, in, is a COVID-19 research information and collaboration platform funded by the North National Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator and led by the four big data innovation hubs, which operate in the Northeast, Midwest, South and West regions of the United States. And every month we bring together a group of researchers studying various topics related to COVID-19 to share their insights, leaving time for Q&A and community discussion. So here's our agenda for today. In a bit, you'll learn a bit more about the KIC, including the opportunities and resources it offers. Then we'll get started with the research lightning talks by our five guest speakers today. And finally, before we close with Q&A, we have a couple of exciting announcements, including the winners of our inaugural KIC student paper challenge, and also an opportunity for you to provide feedback to the National Institutes of Health on the use of common data elements for COVID-19 research. So stay tuned till the end. Now I'd like to introduce Florence Hudson, co-PI on the COVID Information Commons and Executive Director of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub to tell us a bit more about the COVID Information Commons. Florence? Thank you so much, Helen. And we're very lucky to have Helen and a number of our students from Columbia University on the phone helping us out today and Helen leading us into the future. So the COVID Information Commons, as Helen mentioned, it is an NSF funded award. It was awarded last May of 2020. And it provides an open resource to explore NSF funded research addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. We provide materials that include three different search tools, a machine learning clustering tool, a look into all the 990 NSF COVID awards um, that were had been in place since the end of last year, and information that the PIs provide regarding their research, including some of the outputs of their research. There also meet the researcher lightning talk uh, views and videos. There are um, over 50 data sets from around the world regarding COVID, and you can always look at our different events here as well for our monthly lightning talks. So we're very grateful to the NSF Convergence Accelerator for funding this, and we're fortunate that the four big data hubs can work on this together. And I'm joined today by some of the executive directors of the other hubs, including John McMullen from the Midwest Hub, and I believe Renata Rawlings Ghost is going to join us from the South, as well as Sarah Stone from the West. So thank you very much, Helen. You're on mute. Thank you, Florence. Um, and thank you for that introduction. So here are the speakers we have today. Alka Sapat from Florida Atlantic University, Ruth Sarah Moreno from the University of Rochester, David Koniski from Indiana University, Austin Mass from Florida State University, and Peter Paroli from the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. So each of these speakers will be giving a short lightning talk and we ask that you give that you add your questions to the Zoom chat and the speakers will respond to them asynchronously after their chat and we'll leave time at the end for further Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alka Sapat from Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Sapat, I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. I'm sharing my screen. Um, so I'm just going to go to slideshow. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And um, just to uh, introduce our project, um, it was a rapid uh, grant that we received, um, and it focuses on health, housing, and hazards, COVID-19, subjective resilience, intersectional vulnerabilities, and policy evolution in hurricane-prone counties. Um, our grant team was myself um, and Diana Mitsova from Florida Atlantic University, and Margaret Esnard from the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies, Georgia State University, uh, Monica Escalaris from Economics at Florida Atlantic, and our two PhD students, one from Public Administration and one from um, the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at FAU. Um, so our, our focus in um, our study was basically on looking at multiple hazards, and we wanted to look at the impact of COVID-19 in hurricane-prone counties, and basically how, COVID, how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the subjective perceptions of resilience of individuals and households who are living in areas that are already still recovering from past hurricanes because prior to COVID, um, Florida suffered, you know, um, hurricanes Irma um, and Michael and, um, you know, and is always vulnerable to more hurricanes as well. So that was one of our first research questions. Our second research question was um, trying to look at, you know, the extent of um, policies um, 
and the impact of the policies that were both evolving, fragmented, and ambiguous at the federal, state, and local level to address COVID-19, and how that affected the coping and adaptive capacities of individuals and households, particularly those that were most vulnerable. So given these two research questions, um, we um, looked at you know, the subjective resilience of, of individuals and households, in particular their adaptive and coping capacities. And adaptive capacity is basically defined as the capacity to learn from an evolving crisis to adjust and modify behavior, while coping capacity deals with the ability of organizations, peoples, and systems to um, adapt uh, to cope with you know available skills and resources um, with um, and manage adverse conditions um, to um, deal and cope with these emergencies that contribute to the reduction of disaster. In looking at that, um, we as we said, focused on vulnerable populations, uh, because as we could see from even the start of the pandemic, minority populations, in particular African Americans and Latinx populations, were disproportionately affected. Um, they had higher age adjusted rates for hospital hospitalization and lived in many of the areas that were hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, we were also interested in how potential eviction um, and uh, housing issues affected COVID-19 uh, recovery perceptions and uh, looked at in particular over people who were living in overcrowded living environments, who were living in precarious housing situations, people who had to double up, who were, who were facing the threat of eviction and um, you know, how that would affect the ability to comply with pandemic mitigation strategies that basically ask them to shelter in place and um, engage in social distancing and self-quarantining. Um, the other vulnerabilities that we looked at were households with elderly populations, with the young, with, with disabled populations, those with limited transportation access, crowded living arrangements, and those with less healthcare system resources. Uh, we also looked at essential workers and the barriers that they faced um, to social distancing and self-quarantining. In addition to that, we were looking at risk perceptions and looking at how direct personal experience uh, with COVID-19, for instance, would affect levels of perceived risk, um, and as well as risk communications from those who they viewed as trusted sources. And you know, uh, research again has shown that this the individual responses to messaging um, with respect to any disaster, and particularly with respect to COVID-19 and, and subsequent policies, um, have varied depending upon the media sources that people rely on, as well as the political persuasions of individuals. With that, um, our research design included um, repeated cross-sectional population surveys um, via the internet and landlines, and we had three waves. The first was in July 2020, the second in November, um, November 2020, and the third was just completed in April 2021. The surveys were administered both in English and Spanish. Our, our test area was Florida, as noted earlier, and we combined um, uh, the sampling from and uh, the responses from the online and landline phones um, using propensity score matching. Um, we also weighted our sample um, to reflect um, the, the population and be representative of the population. The initial findings that we have from uh, both the survey one and survey two were basically in terms of, for instance, the ex uh, response to the question whether people had learned to adjust to the disruptions of everyday life caused by the pandemic. Um, we found that, you know, obviously by November, there had been some learning going on and people had learned quite a bit. Uh, a lot to adjust to the disruptions that had been caused by the pandemic, but they still, you know, had not, did not feel that comfortable. And, you know, in fact, you know, when it comes to the response a great deal, there were fewer in survey two in November who responded positively to that. With respect to our other initial findings, we also found that in terms of coping with financial difficulties, the stimulus checks uh, were more helpful in July. Perhaps by November, you know, we, uh, uh, we we estimate that basically the effect of the stimulus checks were running out, and people were relying more on family members, on food banks, and and nonprofit organizations, as well as a little bit on temporary jobs. Um, to the extent that COVID influenced how socially connected people felt, um, definitely by the, you know, by November, the percentage who felt less connected was much higher. Um, so there was a difference between the first and second surveys with response to that. Um, with regard to um, our um, 
looking at the um, responses that we got, uh, this is based on just the responses I'm sharing of the first survey right now. Uh, and in response to the question of whether people felt they had recovered or perceptions of recovery, when they felt they would recover from the pandemic, um, the expectations of the length of recovery were positively associated with several factors, such as, you know, the adaptive capacities, those who were better able to adapt thought, you know, recovery would be much faster. Uh, those, however, who, you know, had found that there was much greater risk uh, were more were stressed out about um, the pandemic, or who were not prepared, who were worried about the hurricanes, felt recovery would take much longer. Um, any people with health care issues and health insurance issues also uh, felt recovery would take much longer, perceptions of recovery um, were expected to be much longer. Um, but in terms of the factors that did help, there were social connections. Again, those who were very connected, uh, we found that was significant in our research that it, they felt the recovery would be much shorter. Those who received assistance from food banks te and temporary jobs um, uh, were also and thought that policies were effective in their areas, also thought that recovery would be much faster. Um, with respect to race and ethnicity, we, we uh, found interestingly that, you know, Hispanic and Latinx populations, even though they were the uh, most badly affected um, in, by the pandemic in a lot of these areas, they were more positive about recovery, and we attribute that to the sort of the Latinx paradox, um, you know, where uh, past research has also found that Latinx populations tend to be more optimistic um, about um, uh, recovery and disasters. Um, we found that trust also matters with respect to news media organizations and family doctors, uh, for instance, people who trusted um, who trusted the sources of information and, and the family doctor, you know, had different perceptions of recovery from those who did not. So um, some of our key contributions um, and applications to this is um, we hope this helps advance knowledge and perceptions of the resilience of individuals and households, particularly when they're faced with multiple hazards, um, such as health risks, the pandemic, from the pandemic and precarious housing conditions and exposure to hazards such as hurricanes. And we hope that this can help improve policies and practices to improve pandemic preparedness and management, and particularly for socially vulnerable populations with respect to housing, sheltering, and evacuation in hazard prone areas. Um, one of some of the key points is that we find that, you know, basically the voice of practitioners and policymakers will be critical, and there's a need for obviously more coherent policy responses with consistent messaging, messaging that aligns with clearer scientific guidelines. Um, and when we have that, that could lead to better collective cognitions of risk and a more socially cohesive response. So with that, um, I'd just like to um, thank you as well as thank uh, the National Science Foundation for the funding that they provided for this research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sapat. And please add any questions into the chat. So next up, we have Dr. Ruth Sarah Moreno from the University of Rochester. Okay, now I'm not muted, right? Can you see my slides? Yep, as we can. Uh, nice. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for inviting us to participate in the Lightning Talks. Um, I don't think that this virus needs introduction. I just want to bring to your attention the simplicity of this infectious agent. It consists only on an, of an envelope or lipidic bilayer that is embedded in several glycoproteins, including the S or spike that binds to the ACE2 receptor on the human airway epithelial cells and that allows the virus to enter into the cells. Underneath this envelope, there's a nucleocapsid that consists of a single strand of RNA around 30 kilobases long. That's the genome of the virus, and it's wrapped in the N or nucleocapsid protein. So similar to other coronaviruses that infect humans, SARS-CoV-2 is the result of a spillover event of a coronavirus infecting bats that was transmitted to an intermediate host and then reached the human population. Exposure to viruses that infect other species is common. However, in most of those occasions, the interactions lead to dead ends. In few occasions, however, those interactions can result in a productive infection due to the failure of the species barrier at uh, containing the pathogen. If, uh, if due to the growth in the human population, there is an overlap with the habitat of the natural host, this increases the likelihood of future potential exposure events that can set the stage for adaptation where uh, the virus can accumulate mutations, undergo recombination events, and finally natural selection operates. An indication of such adaptation is the presence of human to human transmission where the interaction with the direct host is no longer uh, required. 
So since the beginning of the century, three highly pathogenic coronaviruses have emerged in the human population. The original SARS coronavirus one, MERS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus two. All of them are the result of spillover events of uh, beta coronaviruses infecting bats that were transmitted to other mammals and then uh, they finally reached humans. Something characteristic about these infections is that human-to-human -human transmission appear quite rapidly, which indicates that these viruses find an ideal um, cellular environment for the replication in the natural, intermediate, and the final host. And we hypothesize that autophagy is one of those cellular processes that coronaviruses use for the replication, since autophagy is highly conserved across mammals. So autophagy consists on the formation of double membrane vesicles, also called autophagosomes, for the collection of cargo, such as misfolded proteins, malfunctioning organelles that need to be delivered in the lysosome for their elimination. If we look at this schematic of the life cycle of coronaviruses, we can see that something peculiar in these infections is the active remodeling of the cellular membranes to generate double membrane vesicles or DMVs that work as viral replication factories. This is the location where the replication of the genome of the coronaviruses takes place. And the structure of these DMVs closely resembles that of autophagosomes, which is why we hypothesize that coronaviruses, and in particular SARS-CoV-2, may hijack the autophagy machin machinery as a source of these double membrane vesicles. So this NSF rapid consists of two different objectives for the sake of time. I'm only going to discuss objective two, which relates to this interaction between autophagy and coronaviruses. So for these experiments, we engineer a set of cell lines that, in, that express an uh, autophagy marker, LC3, fused with GFP, so we can monitor autophagosome formation and autophagy flux. Uh, the cell lines that we engineer are the Vero E6 cell, which is a prototype cell line for coronavirus research, ACE2 expressing ferret lung cells, bat lung cells, and ACE2 expressing human lung cells, in particular the A5 or mine cells. In addition to these cells, we also acquire a library of uh, the different open reading frames that are encoded in the SARS coronavirus genome. So we could assess how individual expression of these genes affect autophagosome formation and autophagy flux. And we could see some candidates such as the open reading frame 3A, 7A, the structural protein M, and the non-structural proteins 6 and 14. And this was very exciting because this indicates that these uh, proteins uh, are triggered in autophagy. However, we need to take this information with caution since these experiments were performed under conditions of transfection in the absence of the rest of the SARS-CoV-2 genome that may also help modulate the expression of these proteins. So the next step is to reconcile this information in the context of an infection. So while we were waiting on the BSL-3 clearance and receiving the PPE, the um, personal protective equipment, we performed some of these assays using another coronavirus, a biosafety level two coronavirus that infects humans, OC43, and also affects the respiratory tract. So the first thing that we did was assessing at what time post-infection we are detecting already genome replication, because by then the remodeling of the cellular membranes must have already happened. And we can see an exponential increase in the amount of copies of genomic RNA uh, accumulated between four and eight hours post-infection. And this is consistent with the fact that we are already detecting the novel viral particles eight hours post-infection. So the next thing that we did was infecting our engineer cells with OC43 at a multiplicity of infection of one. And this means that each single cell is receiving one viral particle. And we performed time-lapse live imaging for eight hours to see if there were any fluctuations in autophagosome formation. So these are some representative images of this study where we had three different experimental conditions. The first one was cells treated with rapamycin on the top. Rapamycin is a drug that triggers autophagy and this uh, allows us to, to use it as a positive control. Uh, mock treated cells in the middle and then in the bottom we have the OC43 infected cells. The first thing that I want you to see is that at time zero, with no exposure, with no stimuli, we are already detecting autophagosomes that are depicted by these pante, these shiny dots. This is normal and this is expected. Autophagy is very important for cellular homeostasis and there's always going to be some degree of autophagy activation, some cells even more than others. 
The next thing that I want you to notice is that two hours after uh, stimulating the cells with rapamycin, we see a significant increase in autophagosome formation, even in the cell that already had a lot of autophagy going on, but even more in the other one that we barely even saw uh, in the previous picture. Uh, over time, these autophagosomes increase not only in number, but also they enlarge, they increase in size. And then by eight hours post-treatment, we start seeing a decline in autophagosome number, which is uh, an, an indication of the resolution of this pathway. Fusion with lysosomes will result in the elimination of these uh, structures. In the mock-treated cells, we don't see much fluctuations in the number of autophagosomes over time. And then in the OC43 infected cells, we see increase in autophagosomes, particularly at six hours post-infection. But unlike the cells treated with rapamycin, we don't see the enlargement in autophagosomes and the number seems to remain more steady. So these are the uh, quantifications of the kinetic study for all the cells that we imaged and we quantified. Once again, the mock treated cells, no much fluctuation over time. Rapamycin treated cells, huge increase in autophagosomes, plateaued and then resolution. And in the OC43 infected cells, we see an increase in autophagosome formation, not as much as with rapamycin, but we don't see um, the enlargement of autophagosomes and the resolution of that pathway. This is encouraging. This may indicate that um, this particular coronavirus is somehow taking advantage of the autophagy machinery. But this could also be interpreted differently. Uh, we know that autophagy not only is important for cell homeostasis, it's also a very important antiviral defense mechanism. So at this point, we are not sure if this increase in autophagosome is virus in the use or is the cell responding to the infection. So one way that we can answer this question, and I apologize because these experiments are ongoing this week and I don't have the data yet, but the one way to, to answer this question is to see if the replication machinery of the virus co-localizes with these autophagic structures. On one hand, the replicates, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but also the products of genome replication, the novel copies of genomic RNA, byproducts of the replication, like double-stranded RNA. The next thing that we need to do is repeat these experiments with SARS-CoV-2. We now have the biosafety clearance. We have the stock of viruses, so we are ready to go. One question that we are very interested in answering is if we see differences among different variants of SARS-CoV-2, particularly those variants that are highly transmittable, like the UK variant and the South African area. So stay tuned. I'll keep you posted on this. Um, and with this, I would like to thank those who have contributed to this work, especially my grad student, Yue Shan Shen. She's a brilliant grad student, super motivated, very enthusiastic. She's the true leader of this, uh, of this project and it's a privilege having her in the lab, so I couldn't be happier. The rest of the team, Yuhang, Sydney, Jared, and Sergio, who recently moved for a postdoctoral fellowship in, in Sweden. And of course, NSF for funding and support. Um, thank you. I'll be happy to take questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Moreno. Um, and it's very exciting to hear that you're waiting on uh, more data results to come. Yes, week. <laughs> <laughs> so next up, we have Dr. David Kuniski from Indiana University. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining today. And special thanks to Florence and Helen for organizing us. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I'm here to talk about our project on the effects of COVID-19 on household energy and security. This is collaborative work with Sonia Carley, who's also a professor here at Indiana University, as well as two of our PhD students, Michelle Graf and Trevor Mehmet. Uh, in addition to having funding from NSF, we have support for this project from the Sloan Foundation, as well as from Indiana University. So the place to start, I think, is with what is energy and security, right? And it's, it's a simple idea. It's the idea that um, it's sort of a condition where households are unable to afford to pay uh, to meet sort of their basic energy needs, right? So think about electricity or natural gas or heating oil. And we've come to rely on these as critical services. Think about charging our electronic devices, increasingly e-learning, right, requires access to electricity and Wi-Fi networks, keeping our food. Um, fresh and, and nutritious. Um, a lot of folks rely on electricity for their med for medical needs, right? Uh, folks rely on electronic medical devices, for example. And of course, there are heating and cooling needs. There's a tremendous amount of things for growing research showing that households that are unable to meet their basic energy needs suffer from a whole set of physical and mental health effects. So it's Folks who are unable to sort of meet their energy um, suffer from a, a whole set of adverse effects, which we should be concerned about. 
In this project, we are trying to uh, answer a few research questions. First is how prevalent energy insecurity is at the household level in the United States. And of course, in particular, how the COVID-19 pandemic has made it worse. Uh, we're interested to know who suffers the most from energy insecurity, what factors lead households to be more or less energy insecure. And then finally, what are the implications for households when they do become energy insecure and how do they cope with that? So to answer these questions, what we've done with this project is um, conduct a longitudinal survey of low-income households in the United States. So this is a four-way panel survey of a nationally representative sample of low-income households. And what that means um, uh, specifically are households that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. And to give you a sense of what that means for a family of four, those are households that are earning $26,000, uh, $26,200 or less uh, in a year, and that was as of 2020. And what we've done is conduct this uh, a panel survey where we're gonna track these same households over time, over sort of a year um, during the duration of the pandemic. We sort of think about the beginning of the pandemic as when the economic disruption uh, began, right around March of, of 2020. And we're going to check in with these households periodically over the subsequent year. So the first wave of our survey was at the very end of April, beginning of May, 2020, and it was of about 20, almost 2,400 households. We then went back into the field um, to the same households in August of last year. And we had a, a, a sample of about 2,200 uh, people. We went back again for a third time in January um, and our sample um, is still quite large. It's almost 1,700 people. And we are about to go into the field for our final wave uh, next week. Um, so we're very excited to get the fourth wave of our survey. What we're trying to do in the survey is capture people's experiences with energy insecurity to measure it and to identify um, how they're coping, what sort of the implications are for, for them. So what I'm gonna do today is just share with you a few set of results, mostly from the first wave of the survey. Uh, the first question we have is how prevalent energy insecurity is. And we're measuring that in three ways, whether or not uh, a household could afford to pay an energy bill uh, in, in uh, at least one month or in all months, I should say, uh, over the course of both the past year. So the year prior to the pandemic beginning and then in that initial month of the pandemic. Uh, a second measure is whether or not people who could not afford to pay an energy bill receive a shutoff notice from their utility. And then third, whether or not they were actually disconnected from their service. And what you can see here is that um, if you go back in a year's time, you can sort of think about this as sort of pre-pandemic levels, um, about a quarter of our sample were unable to pay an energy bill in at least one month during this period of time. And a similar percentage were unable, or sorry, received a, a disconnection notice um, because they were in arrears. About 11% of our sample actually lost their service at some point in the prior year. Now, what's interesting is you can look at just the initial month of the, of the, the pandemic sort of hit and we had the economic disruption, all the stay at home orders were in place, for example, um, that there was a very large proportion of those who had lost, who were, sort of, were unable to pay the energy bill that occurred to them in, in April and May of 2020, right? Um, so about 12, 13% of our sample were unable to pay that particular bill during April or May. Um, similarly high numbers for those who received disconnection notices and you know, about five, six percent actually had their service disconnected during that first month of the pandemic. We can sort of take these estimates from our survey and extrapolate out to the population, give you a sense of how many people this affects. And as you can see here, we're talking about millions of households and tens of millions of individuals who are affected by energy insecurity. The next thing we do is run regression analyses to identify what are the characteristics of households that are experiencing energy insecurity across, again, these three measures. Um, we do this separately for the past sort of the, the pre-pandemic era, sort of the past year, as well as that initial month, April, May of 2020. And just to summarize these regression results, what you're seeing here is that households who have at least one child under the age of five, um, households where someone relies upon an electronic medical device, Households that are sort of people of color, Blacks and Hispanics in particular, people, households are particularly at the low end of the income uh, perspective, and those who are living in energy inefficient house, uh, housing conditions. In both sort of, sort of, uh, from a chronic standpoint, as well as an acute standpoint, so the full year prior to the pandemic and this initial month, all of these characteristics are positively predicting uh, households that are um, experiencing energy insecurity across the three measures that we're looking at, right? So they're all more likely on average to uh, not be able to pay an energy bill, um, to receive a shutoff notice from their utility, as well as to get disconnected. 
The next thing we look at is sort of COVID specific um, shocks that people, the households may have suffered. So controlling for all those factors, which I just um, uh, talked about, we separately measured through which people felt personal economic hardship as a result of the pandemic, whether or not they lost employment hours, whether or not they actually had COVID or COVID-like symptoms. And all these cases, what you see is that even controlling for income and race and, and you know, housing conditions, the effects of COVID and the economic dislocation that resulted further put people into a precarious situation relative to their energy needs. One kernel of good news is that people who receive their COVID relief checks tend to do better, right? So that influx of cash assistance that people receive from the federal government allowed them to be more energy secure. And finally, just to sort of give you a sense of what we've learned in sort of the subsequent waves of the survey, um, we looked at waves two and three. What we find is that, um, generally speaking, results um, are very stable and very similar, which is to say energy security has sort of continued uh, through you know, the first six, nine months of the pandemic. Uh, we did see an increase of the prevalence of energy insecurity during the summer of 2020, but a bit of a diminishment uh, in the fall. But racial, ethnic, income disparities remain. And uh, we further have sort of evidence showing that people who are able to access government services tend to do a little bit better. So that's a key, uh, a key policy intervention to alleviate some of the energy security that we see. So I will leave it at that. Thank you all very much. If you're interested more in the study and our work, please contact me. We have um, results from the survey up on this website here, and I'd be happy to share more about our work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaniski. Very important work as we continue to try to recover economically from the pandemic. So thank you. Um, and so next up, we have Dr. Austin Mask from Florida State University. Thanks so much for inviting me. I wanna start by recognizing that this was a team effort and we had a great team. Oops. Crises like the pandemic emerge and we find ourselves in urgent need of data. Sometimes the data we need are about biodiversity. In this case, we'd like to know things about bats. In other cases like oil spills, it might be the entire biota in a particular region about which we need data. Until our work, we didn't have a set of crisis response protocols to rapidly enhance data about an important source of biodiversity information. So, that is the world's three to four billion biodiversity specimens. As we see in our current pandemic, it could be that a narrow subset of those specimens suddenly becomes critical to crisis response. Specimens have associated information that documents the what was collected, where it was collected, who collected it, and other information. There are also time capsules of potential information, since genomic data can often be derived from a specimen or its disease-causing agents. These are just a few specimens of the species of horseshoe bat in which the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2 has been found, that is Rhinolophus affinis. We targeted a set of three closely related families, including the family of Rhinolophus affinis, uh, for specimen data enhancement. These are the mappings of horseshoe bat specimens at the two major aggregators of specimen data. I wanna emphasize that data coming from collections and served by these aggregators are valuable in their current state. However, the data have some qualities that can be improved through consideration of the data in aggregate. And the data have been created over two or more decades, meaning that the data have not all benefited from our current understanding of best practices and the availability of software to improve some steps. We focused on enhancing the data in these ways, and I'll walk through those in bold with you. If you pay attention to the change in slide title, you can follow our relatively rapid progression through these activities. The specimen data coming from the two major aggregators has overlapped, but it's not identical. Deduplicating their records produced about 90,000 in-scope records. 
The records are curated by 118 institutions worldwide. The top 10 of these institutions together share 63% of the record. We could only assign or assess coordinates for collections, uh, collection locations when those locations are described in the shared data. And about two thirds of the records had that information. Of those, about two thirds arrived with pre-assigned coordinates and the third did not. We were able to assess or assign coordinates in 95% of the total possible cases, and we modified pre-existing coordinates about half the time. The median amount that a pre-existing coordinate was moved was six kilometers. Importantly, the relevant metadata fields went from mostly empty to mostly complete with such useful information added as georeferencing protocol and georeferencing resources. In this summary at the country level, you can see where the greatest number of specimens have been collected by the size of the pie chart and the relative number of new coordinates added to the specimens from those countries. Here are the coordinates for collecting locations for each of our focal families. We compared our coordinates with prior range maps for the species when they were available from the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Here's an example range circumscription in red for one species. This is again, Rhinolophus affinis. And our coordinates for that species in green. We found that georeferenced Specimens suggest range extensions for 153 of the 169 focal bat taxa for which we have these kinds of maps. This is a significant, significant expansion of our understanding of where to find the bats. This is a screenshot of a web-based horseshoe bat data explorer for IUCN map assessors and other stakeholders to look at locality coordinates relative to the current IUCN maps with links back to complete records in our system. The records arrived with 2,930 distinct values referencing people who collected or identified the specimens. We were able to assign 803 unique identifiers to a subset of those values. These unique identifiers were ORCID IDs when the person is living and Wikidata QIDs when the person is deceased. An additional 437 values representing 359 people are reasonably assigned to persons currently living, but who do not yet have an ORCID ID. To do this, we engaged 34 people who are mostly bad experts from 13 countries. These experts and our data curators found that they could associate about half of the records to a unique identifier for specimen collector, and about two thirds of those for specimen identifier. The value of doing this for a crisis response might not be immediately apparent, but it could be among the most important things that we did. We identified 117 living people with ORCID IDs with experience collecting the bats. You might say that it's easy to find the bat experts, just approach their professional societies or do a literature search. However, the bat collectors and those you might find in that way will only partially overlap. The bat collectors turned out to include a considerable diversity of professions, including those who are not professional biologists. Here are a few other descriptor, descriptions of collectors with valuable experience doing field work in sometimes remote areas. Remember, excuse me, remember, we also identified 359 living bat collectors who don't have ORCID IDs. Together, this is a Rolodex of potential contacts for those of you who need to go back into the field to relocate bat populations. Prior to data enhancement, 5.5% of the records had information about associated sequences. We identified an additional about 1,100 specimens with which we could associate new sequences that we found. Our version data, and importantly, our protocol, 
protocols are shared at Zenodo so that we have now blazed a trail that others can follow for rapid data enhancement of specimens during the next crisis. We expect to share our final versions of everything there very soon. However, I will note that the current version that's up right now is very close to the final version. We're close to submission of a manuscript focused on the work and expect to make the Horseshoe Bat Data Explorer broadly available to those who need it. The EU recently announced new funding for the creation of records about, 20, about uh, approximately 20,000 bat specimens. Uh, and we expect the foundation that we laid to speed up that work. I want to thank those who contributed their time and expertise to the people disambiguation and they're in that first paragraph but not assigned ORCID IDs there for lack of space. And thank you to NSF for supporting the work. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Moss. Next, um, next and finally, we have Dr. Peter Paroli from the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. All right, um, this is a project about improving computational epidemiology with higher fidelity models of human behavior. Um, <clears throat> this is a project that I'm doing with my co-PIs, Christian LeBeer and Mark Gore. Uh, Christian's at CMU and Mark is at the University of Virginia. And we have uh, a larger cast of contributor contributors that are working on all varieties of things ranging from natural language processing to uh, epidemiology. Um, <clears throat> this project was motivated by the realization that last year we were in the midst of historically the most massive attempt ever to change uh, human behavior. And I'm talking about specifically non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, such as social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, and now uh, vaccination. And uh, um, decision makers and, and people who are trying to uh, 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 manage public health, um, rely on epidemiological models to forecast rates of infections and deaths and to try to understand what the possible effects are of these MPIs, these non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Unfortunately, a lot of these models uh, are not very detailed and have a huge abundance of uncertainty. Um, and to some degree, we believe that that's partly because they do not really have accurate models of how people respond psychologically and behaviorally to NPIs and to what uh, is going on in the environment around them. Uh, and just to give you a concrete example, this is one of the many models that we've seen on the news uh, or on the web uh, over the past year. Um, it's a snapshot that I took in October. And uh, on the right-hand side of that graph is a projection for the, fall, the month following October when this was presented. And what you can see is this huge pink error bar around the prediction. And that uh, the difference between the top and the bottom of that confidence interval is, a, is an order of magnitude. And within that pink area, you could reasonably say things might go up, they might stay the same, or they might go down. So these models have a large degree of uh, uncertainty, and we are making the bet that um, by understanding and uh, modeling more, more specifically individual psychology, um, that we will be able to do better. And this is partly because I think we all believe that people's beliefs and attitudes and intentions and self-efficacy all have an impact on how they respond. And there's certainly um, evidence out there that that is the case. Um, and it is also the case that these responses seem to change over time. So we've heard a lot about COVID fatigue and how people's attitudes change uh, over time. And these things also seem to vary across regions. So some regions seem to respond differently than others. So uh, our uh, aim was to, to build computational predictive models uh, that are based on a variety of things that we had already been working on. Uh, so uh, one set of things was around uh, theories of individual health psychology that some of us had worked on. Another is um, a, a large 
uh, amount of experience with a particular theory and computational modeling system called ACTAR, which allows us to build computational models of behavior change and to develop uh, agent-based uh, simulations. And so out of this, um, our goal was to develop what we call psychologically valid agents that uh, we could build into agent-based models that would allow us to accurately predict the dynamics of, of changing behavior over time and how those dynamics are impacted by these MPIs, by government messaging, mass media, social media, disinformation campaigns, et cetera. The theory itself, that's the core of our work, uh, ACT-R, is, is a constrained, very principled framework for modeling human behavior. It's a theory of the structure of the brain and the functioning of the mind. It's also a, a simulation environment. And it essentially says how the modules of the brain that uh, carry out uh, goals and memory and perception, how they operate together dynamically over time to produce uh, behavior. It allows us to model uh, both the symbolic knowledge that people have, as well as their statistical adaptivity to the things that are going on around them. And it includes about 45 years of research uh, based in the laboratory, as well as real world applications, a lot of fMRI and EEG imaging uh, data. Um, and so, one way to think of this is we're trying to build these individual level agents that can simulate the, what we call the response profiles of people. Uh, that is, you know, whether they will in fact wash their hands or wear masks or social distance, or are they gonna go out and party or go, to, um, uh, uh, go out uh, to restaurants. Uh, and these agents are gonna be seeded with representations of individual level attitudes and beliefs and intentions. And then those agents will be embedded in an agent-based simulation of, of given regions and periods. And from that, we want to be able to predict uh, actual behavior that we will compare against some proxy measures that we have of behavior, including uh, mobility data from Unicast and uh, mask wearing data that's collected daily from uh, COVIDcast. And um, the way that we are seeding these models is using a variety of data that are out there already including these daily polling data sites. Uh, we're also doing a lot of analysis of uh, mass media and online information and uh, using that to, uh, to get representations that we think uh, characterize individuals in these different regions over time. So just to give you some examples, um, we're, uh, we're ingesting um, a data set called the Third Eye Chiron data set, which is basically a textualized version of uh, CNN, MSNBC, and all the other uh, major uh, uh, news networks. We've got access to a variety of uh, data sets of, of Twitter, including a geotag uh, COVID data set uh, for the world. And uh, our, our CMU partners have a system called Casos, which analyzes data from the United States uh, in, in great detail and at great volumes. And so here are some plots of pro versus uh, con tweet volumes in a variety of cities in California that we've collected. Uh, and we use uh, uh, um, GPS mobility tracking provided by Unicast, as well as uh, a day by day polling data about behaviors uh, from the CMU COVID cast uh, folks at Delphi. Um, so, just to give you um, one thread of analysis that we're doing. <clears throat> Uh, a bunch of folks who are doing natural language processing and machine learning over Twitter um, are inducing what we call stances, which are representations of attitudes, beliefs, and intentions from individual level tweets, which are then aggregated up to the users who are making those tweets. Um, and these are uh, uh, stances or attitudes, beliefs towards certain things like mask wearing or social distancing. Uh, we do that at large scale and then use the representations that come out of that natural language processing to seed the uh, representations inside of this psychological valid agent, computational agent that we're using in our sims. Um, just to give you some ideas of the kinds of behaviors or phenomena that we're trying to model, um, using our psychologically uh, uh, valid agents, we are modeling a variety of phenomena. These are just a couple. Uh, on the left here, one phenomenon that one sees over and over again uh, across the world is that uh, as the pandemic hit, 
there was um, a, a great decrease in the uh, effective transmission rates down to around one. And then this kind of uh, dampened oscillation around, uh, around a transmission rate of one that seemed to indicate that people were adjusting their behavior to modulate that transmission rate. And our psychological models can in fact uh, model mask wearing in relation to what's going on in the ambient uh, environment in that kind of dampened oscillating pattern, which is in that uh, lower quadrant there. On the right here, we're just showing how, um, how at the aggregate level, this is for four states uh, of uh, polling data about mask wearing, we can, our models can predict uh, pretty well um, what the actual mask wearing uh, probabilities will be in those four states and we can get down to finer grain regional. Uh, areas. So uh, if you want to find out more, please uh, contact me. And I just want to mention that our research is funded by NSF and IARPA. And I want to thank uh, the various folks at the bottom here for providing us with data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perley. And thank you to all of our speakers today. It's incredible to see the incredible breadth of research um, that's being conducted on the pandemic right now. Um, and we thank you for your time. So before we open the floor up for Q&A, um, we have a couple of announcements, including first, um, the announcement of our winners for the inaugural COVID Information Commons Undergraduate Student Paper Challenge. So this challenge was an opportunity for students taking undergraduate classes all over the world to write a paper about a COVID-19 research topic of their choice. Um, we received amazing submissions and we're really excited to announce our top three winners chosen by our judges. And these winners have the opportunity to present their work at a future KIC webinar, as well as have their paper published on the KIC website and the Columbia Academic Commons. So stay tuned for that. And so I'd like to uh, bring back Florence to award some of our first winners. Thank you, Helen, for doing such a great job today. And thank you to all the researchers to present your fabulous work. I've learned so much about bats by listening to you, which mm -hmm. scares me and excites me at the same time. So our first place winner is Jane Pond from Columbia University. She can't be with us today, she's on a plane. Her paper is on contradiction detection of COVID-19 randomized control trials via BERT language models. Um, it was a fabulous paper and uh, she won first place. The next winner is uh, Samson Chen, and Samson is at the University of California, San Diego, and his paper is on generating explanations for chest medical scan pneumonia predictions, another fabulous paper. Uh, and I'm so excited that these two students actually were our seniors um, at their respective universities, and we're really excited about seeing the future work they do. So Samson, I think you're on the phone today. So, or on the Zoom line today, if you want to show your face, we can all congratulate you. Yay, Samson. <laughs> and here's his picture here. Next, I'd like to hand it over to John McMullen, who's the executive director for the Midwest Big Data Hub, to do the next award because this is in his, uh, in his region. John? Thank you, Florence, and thank you, Helen, for the hosting today. Um, I would like to congratulate our third place winner, Aditya Kulkarni, who is a high school student in Minnesota, but is taking courses at the University of Minnesota uh, as well. Uh, his paper is Human Mobility Patterns Linked to COVID-19 Prone Locations. Uh, and I believe that he is on the call here as well today. So congratulations, Aditya, and we look forward to hearing more from you as you move forward in your career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. We were really inspired when we saw that you were a high school student already taking classes at the University of Minnesota for like a year or two. Um, and just so you know, we did get something from the university saying that he really is. And we do want to get people who are way ahead of it, like you are, involved in all these challenges that we're dealing with. So thank you very much. Excellent. And thank you, John, uh, for being a master of ceremony. Uh, now what we'd like to do is uh, briefly review an opportunity, a request for information that the National Institutes of Health has announced, and it has been extended to May 28th, so that's why we wanted to talk about it. It originally um, ended earlier this month, but it's a, it's a request for information on the use of common data elements, or CDEs, for NIH-funded COVID-19 research. And they're looking for public comment on the use of these common data elements, including opportunities 
opportunities for advancing research, um, challenges to adopting CDEs and guidance or tools that can facilitate the use of CDEs, which will help all of us do more collaborative research in the future. So if you're interested in this, you can go to NIH, you can see um, a link here. You could also go to the homepage covidinfocommons.net and we have it right on the homepage. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, and so we have our next webinar um, on June 9th, 2021, and it'll be at 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern again. And you can see the lineup here. You can also find it on the COVID Info Commons website under events and the Northeast Big Data Hub and other uh, Big Data Hub event websites. And what I'd like to announce that's really exciting is we've been inviting the NIH researchers to present as well, because this started as an NSF award. And so NIH researchers are gonna be part of the mix now, which we're really excited about. And as you see more, of these uh, monthly webinars rolling out, you'll see even more into the future. So any NSF or NIH funded researchers, um, actually we also had somebody from HHS, um, AHRQ. Um, and so as you find uh, more of these funded researchers from different agencies, you can please send them our way. So on the next slide, I'm gonna pass this back to Helen to wrap it up and do further Q and A. Thank you so much, Florence, and thank you, John, as well. And so, yeah, we'll open up the floor to Q&A, and I'll leave this slide up. And these are all the ways that you can get engaged with the COVID information comments. So you can learn about more about our upcoming events, including our June webinar. You can sign up for our newsletter, which includes not only information about events, but also about research opportunities. Um, and then you can join the KIT community on Slack as well. And then also you can follow us on Twitter at our new handle, KIT COVID. And uh, please do email us if you're interested in presenting your NSF or NIH funded COVID research at a future KIT webinar. Yes, so, and I should also mention that um, Aditya and Samson have already agreed to actually have their papers uh, put on the Columbia Academic Commons and the KIC, and that we look forward to hosting them to present on a future KIC webinar. So we're really excited that they'll have that opportunity to be in the mix of the other funded PIs um, from NSF and NIH. So that's a very exciting opportunity. So any uh, other questions we have for anything that you've learned today or you'd like to learn further from the COVID Info Commons uh, community engagement? Well, we've answered all the questions. How often does that happen? And uh, Benji, I don't think I saw any other questions that weren't answered in the chat. I think David had a question, but he answered it. Yeah, they were all answered. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. Then we're done right on time. How amazing is that? We wanna thank all of our researchers um, for joining us today and for the incredible research you're doing to address the COVID-19 pandemic today and into the future. We wanna invite everyone to join the COVID community if you haven't been involved, the COVID Info Commons community, if you haven't been involved, unfortunately, everybody on the planet's in the COVID community. Uh, please feel free to join us. We wanna thank Helen for leading us and all the students that we have um, helping us. And John, thank you for co-hosting the award ceremony with me. I really appreciate it. And once again, congratulations to the students. Uh, we're very proud of you. Thank you, everyone. And all of the recordings uh, of the Lightning Talks from today will be available on our on the KIC website um, on our Meet the Researchers page. So do check those out um, and also check out some of our previous Lightning Talks. So we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you all. Be well. Thank bye you. Bye.